Hi, everyone. Welcome uh, to uh, the Azure Cosmos DB Partner Tech Connect. Uh, we started this last month and uh, we have this recurring every uh, first Tuesday of the month and uh, second Friday of the month. One dedicated for special topics, as you see here. Uh, and today we'll be handing over to Deborah, one of our oldest uh, PMs on the team, who will be sharing about the core tenets on uh, Azure Cosmos DB, which is around partitioning and how do we do scale out. So before I hand it out to her, just in the interest of all those of you who are here, I wanted to spend one or two minutes just to give you a quick uh, welcome and a round trip on why this is important for us and uh, what is it that we are trying to do with Azure Cosmos DB partner ecosystem. Uh, we will always be, we are, and we will continue to be a partner-led company. Uh, words uh, from our CEO and I guess uh, many of us here. And we, to that point, we all know that uh, for every single dollar that Microsoft uh, makes, a partner ecosystem, uh, the partners who are involved make up to nine dollars. And uh, this is really the way we want most of our services to be scaled out as well. So in a way, how can we help you be successful and how can we help Cosmos DB and ourselves be successful by helping our partner ecosystem? And that is what we're here launching the Azure Cosmos DB partner framework. Many of you must have seen this last time, wanted to highlight the fact that he, uh, we would have two things that we go along on this. And I'm just going to quickly go forward to kind of say that there is a high touch or a depth initiative from Microsoft, from our engineering team directly, what we call as the partner acceleration program. Today we have close to 50 partners where we either we are doing an onboarding GTM with them, wherein we have joint uh, connection in terms of putting our uh, uh, creating differentiated packages, marketplace deployments, logos on websites. There's a bunch of things that we do. We also work on customers with this high touch partners and help them uh, uh, wherever we need to support. And then we want to proceed what we call as the adoption GTM, wherein together we are successful. We are able to see case studies. We are able to see more advocacy uh, mutually, right? So that is one thing that's ongoing. If uh, you or any of your other partners interested, there is a link uh, where you can uh, upload and uh, reach out to us, right? However, what we are doing today and we continue to launch today is the breadth effort more around self serve and one component of this breadth effort is these specialized topics that we are doing. And really this was just the context to being set so that for any new folks who are joining the call today or people want to share with your friends and other partners uh, feel free to do this. Uh, the last housekeeping before I hand it off to Deborah uh, one is uh, we do have Azure Cosmos DB. Uh, yeah, if we can mute ourselves, that would be great. Uh, so we do have uh, the Cosmos DB certification coming up. Uh, it's a beta cert, DP420 actually, it's typo there. Uh, it's available now. If you're interested, uh, definitely do sign up for that. Other than that, if uh, you or the partners are interested in joining this accelerated program, the high touch one that we just spoke about depth, uh, do send us an email to Cosmos Partners Success at Microsoft.com. Uh, meanwhile, if you're not so sure in having a consistent long term engagement, but really we just want a one on one discussion about a particular customer opportunity where you need some sort of a help. Here's a link and I'm going to put all of this in the IM and we will be sharing this deck as I show you. And so that will be available right here for you to create and Alex from our team will reach out to you and we will chat with you. Uh, do share the meeting invite to your friends, extended partners and teams. Any other feedback, comments, topics you want to hear, uh, do send us an email again. It's like your one stop shop is Cosmos Partner Success at Microsoft.com. Also, if you just go to GodCosmos.com and uh, go over to the Partner tab, you will see all of these information out there. You will see uh, all the sessions, the PowerPoint decks, and also uh, meeting invites that you can uh, add on to your calendar. 
right? Uh, feel free to reach us at cosmospartnersuccess.com. So without further ado, seven minutes on this. Uh, if you do have questions, please do put on the I am happy to answer all of that. Uh, meanwhile, Deborah, if you want to just grab the screen share and uh, share your slides. Thank you so much, Saranya, and thank you for the wonderful introduction and really glad to see uh, everyone here. It's like Saranya said, it's really uh, important for us to be able to support you in the partner ecosystem. Um, so today's uh, presentation is really around that um, and helping shore up one of the key concepts in being successful on onboarding new workloads uh, to Cosmos DB. So the topic for today is an uh, overview of partitioning, so some partitioning 101 and some best practices for how to choose the right partition key uh, for your workload. So we really want this to be an interactive session, so feel free to ask questions, paste questions in the chat. Um, we'll plenty of room for questions. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, we answer anything we can. Um, so the topic for uh, the agenda I have for today is uh, a couple things. Uh, we'll go through an overview of partitioning in Cosmos DB. Uh, what is it? Why is it important? And give you a sense of how it works behind the scenes so you can understand the fundamentals um, of why it's so key, uh, pardon the pun, for your workloads. Uh, then we'll talk about a bit more tactically uh, how you can choose the right partition key for your workload. So we've got some best practices, some steps there to follow. And then I'll show a demo of some of the useful monitoring tools you can use uh, that come with Cosmos DB out of the box uh, to help you monitor your partitions and your uh, performance and your overall overall workload. All right. Uh, so to begin the first topic, just to get some intuition um, of why do we partition in the first place? One of the main value props of Cosmos DB is enabling horizontal scale so that as your workload grows, as you onboard more and more customers, as their data size grows, as the request volume grows, uh, the service can seamlessly handle uh, adding more storage and compute to serve those workloads. Uh, we do this via horizontal scaling, uh, and the underlying principle is instead of having really giant big compute machines that we have, that we either we or you, uh, if you're running this on-prem, have to set up yourself and scale up, we actually distribute our data across multiple machines. Uh, these are uh, machines that hold a subset of the data, um, so they hold a subset of the data and they will serve a subset of the requests. Uh, and basically, with this distributed uh, this distributed system, um, as your workload grows, uh, we'll be able to, and continues to scale, uh, we'll always be able to, as long as you give us a good partition key, continue to keep scaling on your behalf. Um, so in terms of making this more concrete, um, I think it's always great to learn about partitioning in the context of a real world scenario. Um, so we'll go ahead and take an example scenario here, uh, which will be kind of the grounding for the rest of the talk uh, to explain best practices and partitioning. Um, so let's take an example scenario here where we're building a multi-tenant application. And let's say there are tens of thousands of tenants, some of them very large, and some of them might be very small. Uh, and for this example application, we want to keep track of some event information for each of the tenants. In this case, it's login information. Um, so this is similar to, if you think about like Microsoft AED, where a lot of the tenants are doing auth and you have to keep track of login information. Um, so there's lots of tenants, they have variable sizes, but it's undisputable that some of them are much larger than the others. In terms of the data access operation, uh, data access patterns that we want to optimize for, we have write operations that require us to write data for each login event, uh, and read operations which require us to either get all data for a particular tenant, get all data for a particular user in a tenant, or read a single event for a user in a tenant. Um, and this is something that a sample document might look like. Um, so given all this information, I just want to take a quick poll. Feel free to just paste it in the chat. Uh, what are some potential ideas for a uh, partition key in this scenario? Um, if you had to choose one value, uh, one property um, in, uh, in the data set that existed in all documents, uh, or you could make exist in all documents, um, and you think would evenly distribute your request and uh, uh, storage volume um, such that uh, you can include it in most of your queries, uh, what would you pick?
Uh, so, Sarania Dilip, um, I can't quite see the chat um, with my presentation. Anything coming in there? Not yet, uh, Debra. Then if I let you uh, share the IM responses. Sure. Uh, one of the things that came up is tenant ID. And somebody also replied uh, event ID. Makes sense. Yeah, both of them are valid options with different trade offs. So let's actually go ahead and look at uh, behind the scenes what happens for uh, in partitioning and how to evaluate each key. Um, so that's really what we want to. Um, I think this is like the most important thing to grasp is that if you get the sense of in the intuition of what makes a good partition key, then it becomes straightforward to evaluate them for your own workloads. Uh, so this is a good start uh, for folks in the chat. Thanks for pasting those in. Um, so let's take a look, quick look at the behind the scenes architecture of what's happening in Cosmos DB. Um, in this diagram here, there's a couple of things going on. One is think of this as a container level also known as collection. Um, so if you're familiar with relational databases, this is kind of like a table, kind of, except it's NoSQL. So instead of rows, there's freeform JSON documents. Uh, and some of the data modeling is quite different. But think of it as you might put one or a few entities in this collection here. Now, each uh, collection has a partition key that you as a user must set when you create the collection to begin with. Uh, and back by this collection are these things called physical partitions. That's the purple box right here. A physical partition is a physical piece of compute where Cosmos DB is actually storing the uh, data that you want to store in the system, as well as the place that's uh, handling, uh, handling, you know, index looks up, lookups, returning the query for your, re uh, returning the results for your query, etc. So each of these uh, purple boxes is a uh, physical partition, and each physical partition stores a sub subset of the data uh, that you store in it. Uh, so how does it decide which subset of the data should be stored on each partition? Um, Cosmos DB uses a technique called consistent hashing, which means that all data with the same partition key value, uh, for example, say 10 ID, um, are in the gets assigned to a um, it's assigned to a range, um, or sorry, all, all data with the same partition key value uh, hash the same thing and will land in the same range that's assigned to the physical partition ID. Um, so if you imagine uh, the world's simplest hash function where you uh, give it an input, like let's say Contoso is a uh, value, uh, is a partition key value in a document, we hash Contoso and let's say it hashes to a number between zero and 10. Um, so if we had five physical partitions, you might say if you hash to a number between uh, zero and one, uh, between zero and two, uh, you'll be in partition one, three to five, you'll be in partition two, et cetera, until you filled up the entire space. Um, of course, in the uh, eventual partition uh, range, there's like two to the power of 256. So it's a very large range, um, but it's the same concept applies. Uh, there is a range of values and each uh, range is assigned to one partition. So whatever you hash to, um, that uh, whatever range you fall in is where the data will live. Now inside each of these purple boxes is something we call a logical partition. A logical partition is just, it's a logical concept. It just means that it's a grouping of all data with the same partition key value. So if you partition by tenant ID, all data with the same tenant would have the same logical partition key value, which is that tenant ID, and it would always be on the same logical and thus physical partition. So in this diagram here, if you give us a query that you want to find everything for a tenant ID equals Fabricam, uh, because of the way Cosmos DB has stored the underlying data, it can figure out the hash and route it to the physical partition uh, very efficiently. So the nice thing about the system, as you can start to see, is that uh, as data gets written in, it, it gets written to a predictable physical partition. So as you're querying it, it's always predictable. So your queries get very efficient. Um, even if you had hundreds of thousands of partitions, which some of our largest customers do have, uh, as long as you can give the partition key value in the query, 
The system doesn't have to check 100,000 physical partitions, which would be quite slow to get all your data. It can just go to the one that it knows the data is on. Um, so for that reason, one of the best practices for choosing good partition key uh, is to, you can kind of see why it's so important. If you do have a system that has a lot of reads or queries to optimize uh, for that aspect of the, um, of, the, of the data access pattern. All right, um, I'll just pause here and make sure that this diagram makes sense before we keep going to the next, uh, next topic. Uh, Dilip, any questions in the chat? Uh, no, Deborah, nothing else. Uh, so other things to know about partitioning in Cosmos DB uh, are that Cosmos DB actually manages the partitions for you. So each partition can hold a certain amount of data in Cosmos DB. That number is 50 GB. Uh, so unlike uh, other systems where if you think about like uh, at least like my personal laptop, I <laughs> get close to the storage limit uh, all the time and have to delete data or like think about do I need like a external hard drive. Um, with Cosmos DB, uh, this, it's practically storage unlimited. Um, as you write more and more data into the system, because of the way we do horizontal scaling, if the system detects that a physical partition, so one of these purple boxes, is getting close to the 50 GB amount of storage it can hold, uh, Cosmos DB will automatically create and provision a new physical partition for you on your behalf. This all happens transparently, um, such that there are now roughly two physical partitions where roughly half the data is on one and half the data is on another. Um, so during this process, uh, your requests will continue to work. Uh, you will see no impact in your end app application, uh, but the net effect is that you can keep writing more and more data and Cosmos DB will continue adding more compute uh, and storage as uh, as needed. So as a user, there's no need for you to worry, am I going to run out of storage? Uh, unlike other systems that ask you to pre-provision storage upfront, uh, that's not a thing that's needed in Cosmos DB. Just bring your data, keep loading, and the system will handle, uh, handle the scaling of storage. Another fact to know about partitions is uh, the way it kind of coincides with the concept of request units or RUs. A request unit in Cosmos DB uh, and I believe there will be another deep dive on this um, later sessions, but just as an overview, a uh, request unit is basically uh, the amount of, think of it as like an abstract amount of compute uh, resources that you need to do any operation in Cosmos DB. Um, so uh, Cosmos DB works on a provision through the system, uh, although we do have a serverless option as well. Uh, but in general, you'll tell us what's the throughput that you need for your workload. Uh, provision that in the form of request units per second, and Cosmos DB will provision enough compute to guarantee that. Um, so every operation in Cosmos DB consumes some number of request units. So for example, a write of a 1 KB document always consumes around uh, five, uh, five request units. Uh, can, uh, and each read of the same 1 KB document will consume one request unit. So if you provision the total throughput of 30,000 request units or RUs per second, that means in every second, um, every second you can do 30,000 RUs worth of requests. So you could do 30,000 reads of 1KB documents, you could do 6,000 writes of 5KB documents and so on, uh, mix and match. Um, so uh, you'll provision some amount of RUs upfront in Cosmos DB, uh, but these can always be changed uh, later, you can always scale up or scale down depending on your workload. Uh, but the important fact to know is that the RUs are divided evenly among your physical partitions. Um, so, for example, if you provision 30,000 RUs total and you had five physical partitions, each would get 6,000 RUs. Um, so, as you're looking at this, you might think this seems like an internal detail. Uh, why is it so important um, to know this fact? Um, and the reason is when it comes to debugging, when it comes to uh, when it comes to troubleshooting, when it comes to evaluating if your partition key is a good one, uh, knowing this fact will help you. So we'll get into that uh, in a little bit as well. All right. 
Hey Deb, we have a couple of questions. Um, I think it will be good to answer them right now. Uh, the first okay. question is from Paul. Uh, he's asking that um, uh, is there any latency or uh, delay uh, impacts when provisioning a new physical partition under extreme load, especially write load? No. Uh, so what happens behind the scenes, a great question, by the way, what happens behind the scenes is um, if you're using the client, uh, one of our Cosmos DB client SDK, so we have .NET, Java, JavaScript, and, uh, and Python. Um, uh, the way it works when we do a split is we take, there's a parent uh, partition, and basically it needs to get two children partition uh, who will now inherit roughly half the data each. Uh, so uh, the system, when you use the SDK, it actually knows if a, uh, we call them a split internally, if it's going on. Um, and we'll make sure that um, all your requests will get routed to the correct partition. So as long as you're using one of our Cosmos DB client SDKs, uh, there will be minimal impact. Um, the only potential impact you might have is there's a very short period where we do uh, the actual cutover, like stop using this partition, use that partition. Um, if that request needs to retry once, then the SDK will handle it. Uh, but practically, unless your request is literally in that tiny cutover window, uh, you'll see uh, no end impact to your application. Thanks, Deb. Uh, there is one more question on hotspot. Um, how does Cosmos DB handle hotspotting? And uh, does the user have any workaround methods in place if it hits this issue? OK, uh, so by hotspotting, I'm guessing what you mean is, let's say you choose a, a partition key uh, and it's a bit unbalanced uh, and one partition ends up having substantially more throughput or needing more throughput than the others. Right. Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Um, so Cosmos DB, uh, so there's a couple of things you can do today, and we're always building more improvements in the system uh, to, to alleviate this. Uh, one, uh, besides just the fundamentals of making sure uh, you've uh, chosen like a good partition key to try as best as you can to avoid this problem, um, there's a you can also use uh, Cosmos DB auto scale, which will give you a 10x scaling range. Uh, so in terms of handling at least the throughput, if you suddenly get a lot of requests, um, at least that partition and your workload can scale up um, up to 10x uh, to handle that. Um, but that might not be like the best long term solution, right? Especially if it's a consistent hot partition. Um, so uh, we do have uh, some future improvements in the pipeline to uh, make it a bit easier to balance these scenarios. Uh, but for now, um, I'd say between auto scale and just the fundamentals of choosing a good partition key um, should help cover you there. Yeah, I think we are good for now. We can go ahead. Sounds good. All right, so just as a recap uh, of the concepts that we went over, um, so the key things to know here are uh, two main definitions. One is the logical partition, uh, which is all the data stored with the same partition key value. So if you partition by tenant ID, all your data with tenant ID equals Contoso, equals uh, Fabricam, Wingtip Toys, all are in the same, their own respective logical partition. A uh, physical partition is a fixed amount of SSD back storage and compute. And the logical partitions are distributed among the smaller number of physical partitions. Um, and from your user's perspective, you define one partition key per container. Um, I do want to address one extremely common question that we often see um, from folks who are either new to Cosmos DB or new to sharding and partitioning, um, which is that often there's a question about, um, hey, it looks like uh, one of the best practices that we always talk about is to choose a partition key with a lot of distinct values. So a lot of different logical partition values. Um, but doesn't that mean there might be millions of logical partitions? Uh, and will that imply there will be millions of physical partitions, which sure sounds expensive if they're all SSD backed storage and compute. Um, so for example, if you had a user profile system with 1 million users in it, uh, and you provisioned by user ID, would that become um, extremely inefficient or expensive? Uh, and the answer to that is no. Uh, the reason is, like we mentioned before, 
Um, each uh, physical partition holds a subset of logical partitions that all happen to hash into the same range assigned to the physical partition. So in general, there's actually no practical limit to the number of logical partitions you can have. It's just the concept of any number of, of a distinct value um, for your partition key. Uh, so there will typically almost certainly always be um, and there should be a smaller number of physical partitions than logical partitions. So, for example, if you had um, a million uh, user IDs that could all fit into a couple, a few GB of data, that might even be able to fit on one physical partition uh, itself. All right. Um, so, some additional facts about physical uh, partition about partitions. Um, each physical partition can hold up to 50 GB of data and support up to 10,000 RUs. Uh, this fact you don't really have to think too much about since if you run and if the system runs into it, it'll actually split and add more partitions for you. So you never have to worry if I'm running out of storage, do I need more storage? Um, this fact you'll have to think about a bit more and how to handle it in your partitioning strategy. Uh, so we'll cover that as well. Um, each logical partition can hold up to 20 GB of data. So for example, in uh, in our multi-tenant app example, um, if one tenant became really large, then seen at 20 GB, uh, by default, this uh, the system would not scale. So we have some solutions for how to partition in those scenarios as well. Um, and there's no limit uh, practically to the number of logical uh, or physical partitions um, you can hold either. I think uh, you can workloads can run on one partition, which is your entry level 400 RUs. Uh, you know, 50 GB of data workload, and there's also on the higher end, there's workloads with petabytes and hundreds of uh, hundreds of thousands, um, maybe tens of thousands um, of physical partitions. All right, uh, so now that we have uh, some kind of facts and general information about partitioning, let's go ahead and talk about what it takes to choose a good partitioning strategy. So I've tried it overall divided it into roughly uh, three steps with a step zero that's kind of more just helping you assess just how important partitioning is. And we'll go through each of these steps one by one with some examples to figure out um, how to choose a good partition key. All right, uh, so this is a step zero just to give a little bit of context uh, into just how important Cosmos uh, partitioning may or may not be to your workload. So while we always give the best practice that you do want to spend some thought choosing a good partition key, uh, if you have a relatively smaller uh, workload, then the partitioning strategy doesn't, doesn't really affect your performance as much. Um, and as much here refers to if you have a lot of, um, if you have a, a lot of uh, queries, um, if you have a lot of uh, queries that you need to optimize for, uh, but your data only fits, can fit into a small number of physical partitions, then no matter what you choose as your partition key, uh, the query won't have to visit that many partitions anyway. So the additional RUs required, the additional uh, latency to actually run that query is not very high. Uh, in the extreme case, if your data was on one partition uh, at all, then uh, whatever you chose as a partition key would all hash to the same thing. Um, so small here is a bit subjective, but uh, basically the guidance we tend to give is if you have if your workload can fit in around five physical partitions, meaning you have less than 250 GB of data, you need less than 30,000 RUs, then as long as you choose a reasonable partition key, um, the performance, um, the performance like uh, the performance uh, won't be really too affected by whichever key you choose. Uh, so in general, um, if you have uh, such a workload, ID is often a good start if you don't have any other keys in your data sets that might be more natural. Uh, typically, it should try to have like a business value though. So it shouldn't, if it's just a random grid, uh, then it's a bit hard to query, right? Since you can uh, probably hard to construct the random grid. Uh, but for example, things like that user profile store, uh, user ID as the ID would be a natural fit. If you have like a product catalog, product ID as the ID is a natural fit, um, which is what we mean by the business value here. Um, so something like ID is often a good start. Um, and you also want to still want to choose a key with reasonably high cardinality. Um, for example, 
uh, user ID and product ID are good because there are lots of distinct values of those. Uh, but if you chose something like um, something that in an extreme example was a Boolean, right? For example, like true or false, right? Then uh, you would probably uh, run, you might, you could certainly run into the 20 GB logical partition limit quite quickly. Quite quickly. Um, uh, so the uh, so the reason here uh, that you want to choose something with good uh, high cardinality, even in this case, uh, is if your workload scales or grows in the future. Let's say you start with uh, around thirty thousand RUs of throughput, uh, around quarter uh, quarter terabyte of data, uh, but then you onboard you know ten x the number of your customers. Uh, you definitely want that partition key to keep scaling with you, right? And something with a high cardinality uh, is still. Uh, we'll help you out there. All right, so that's just the uh, kind of step zero. Uh, next one is to write out the most common operations. Uh, and by uh, and we often say in at least NoSQL data modeling that you really want to optimize your partition key based on your data access pattern as opposed to the other way around. Um, so oftentimes, I think in relational databases, the first thing you do is you model your schema with your tables and your foreign key constraints. And then when you write the query, you kind of have to fit around all of them and do the joins to uh, construct the result that you want. Um, but in NoSQL data modeling, and especially in Cosmos DB, it's the opposite. You basically figure out what your data access pattern is first, and then design your data model and your partitioning, street, uh, partitioning strategy around that. Um, so the way they do that is we recommend uh, writing out the most common operations um, and literally writing out like my query is select star from C where customer I customer region in like region A or uh, select uh, star where user ID equals insert user ID that we're going to get from a form in the uh, API or this dashboard or web app that we're building. Uh, the more specific, the better. Um, so write out the list of all the reads, all the writes, all the queries. Um, and then try to get an assessment of if you need to optimize for read throughput or write throughput. Um, so if you have an existing workload, um, you can probably look at your existing system uh, to see what kind of uh, workload it is. But it, you can also kind of guess based on the uh, workload pattern. Um, for example, uh, retail websites tend to be, um, at least like the product catalogs, tend to be more uh, read heavy than write heavy. Not everyone buys an item. Uh, but there are some workloads that are certainly write heavy, like ILT workloads, right? Where you have uh, maybe vehicles pushing data points like once every five seconds as they're driving on the road, uh, which is very, very write heavy, 99% writes, and then maybe 1% of an analytics component. Um, so once you figure out if you have a read heavy or a write heavy workload, in general, if you want to optimize for a write heavy workload, let's say around 80% of your workload is writes. Uh, then the best thing you can do is choose a partition key with a high cardinality or high number of unique values. Um, the reason you want to do this is if you remember that picture where we take the hash of the partition key and assign it to a partition, because we use hashing, as long as you give a lot of different uh, different values, in the grand scheme of things, it'll all, uh, it'll all hash evenly to all the partitions. So roughly all the partitions will have the same amount of uh, amount of requests thrown at it, amount of storage, and you'll avoid a hot partition and you'll be balanced that way. In contrast, if you need to optimize for read throughput, then the best thing you can do is to choose the key that appears in most of your query filters. So for example, if you're building a user profile store and you know most of your uh, workload is going to be looking up something for a particular user ID or a set of user IDs, um, then something like user ID that has both high cardinality and can appear in most of your filters uh, would be a good choice there. Uh, so in general, by the end of this step, you should have a pretty good sense of the, uh, the candidate partition keys. Um, if you take literally every key that appears in your where filters and then some other high cardinality keys like ID or any other high cardinality keys that may not, you might always query about, uh, query on, uh, that's a good starting list uh, and then you can apply these next three, uh, next couple of steps to refine uh, and further uh, evaluate and narrow down which key is the right one. Okay, uh, so now they have a list of candidates. Uh, the next thing you want to do is figure out the cardinality of each partition key. How many new values are there for the partition key choice? 
In general, if there's at least, um, uh, depending on the size of the workload, if it's a smaller workload, at least uh, a thousand different values would be great. Um, if it's a much larger workload, then it should scale proportionally. Um, but I think the most important question to, hear, to ask here is, uh, for a single partition key value, would there ever be more than 20 GB of data? Uh, the reason this is so important is that if you end up with a key that exceeds its 20 GB limit, CosmDB will actually stop accepting writes for that value. So you want to be really careful that you think about this and partition against uh, partition with this in mind. So if the answer is yes to this question, then you should consider subpartitioning or hierarchical partition keys, um, which we'll cover as well as a solution for uh, for these kind of multi-tenant scenarios where you will very very likely have tenants that go beyond 20 GB. Um, and then in general, um, as a best practice, uh, also aim for high cardinality keys, especially if you are optimizing for uh, for a write heavy workload. But again, doesn't hurt in read heavy workloads uh, either. Okay. All right, next step um, is more of a um, kind of like a uh, like additional optimization or additional uh, kind of pass fail function, uh, which is uh, just to ask about your workload. Do you need multi document transactions, um, asset transactions that are all or nothing? Uh, Cosmos DB supports these types of transactions, but only across a single partition key value. So, for example, in that user profile store, you can, if you partition by user ID, let's say user ID Alice has 10 documents. You could do an asset transaction across all these documents. Let's say she updates her email address, so you need to update it in all 10 documents. Um, so if this is a requirement in your workload, uh, we find out this is a requirement. Uh, this is a feature that uh, not every customer in Cosmos DB uses, but for those who do use it, it's very important and key to their workload. Um, so if this is a requirement, then make sure uh, your partition key strategy supports that. Um, so, for example, uh, in that user profile scenario, user ID, you would basically have to partition by user ID if transactions across the user ID were uh, were required. Uh, the good thing about that is the user ID, for many other reasons, is already a good key. All right, I'll take a pause here and see um, if there are any questions or uh, comments in the chat. Uh, Deb, we are getting a few questions, uh, but it is something which we are able to answer. Um, provide some links and information on that. So we can go ahead uh, unless somebody wants to ask a few questions on uh, this specific um, uh, section which you are talking about. Yeah, I think we can go ahead. Thank you. OK, great. Uh, so before I get into um, a just a quick demo of some of the um, some of the uh, tooling you have at your disposal to look at your partitions and RU usage, as well as uh, some information about the subpartitioning or hierarchical partition keys feature, I uh, just want to give one last bit of general guidance here, uh, which is when it comes to choosing a partition key, if especially you're at the beginning of the workload. Um, it's something you can experiment with. It's not something that, um, like, uh, in the design phase, it's much easier to try a few different keys, make a few collections with different candidate keys, uh, set up your representative workload, and actually measure how it's doing. And then at the end, you can pick the one that works the best experimentally. Um, so everything we just discussed, steps kind of zero through three, excuse me, uh, were uh, very, were actually quite theoretical in terms of what to do, right? But when you actually run your workload, you can do things like measure the RU charge of your common operations. For example, if you know 80% of your workload is queries um, of this nature, then you can see with partitioning strategy one, this query consumes 10 RUs, which is quite low, but with this strategy, it consumes 100 RUs, which is quite high, right? And then that can kind of guide uh, the one where you want to choose the most optimal cost RU charge for uh, that common operation. Um, the other thing to check is just the end-to-end -end latency of your common operations. So if you see this query uh, performs faster with this partition key, then uh, and has lower RU charge, uh, then that would be the way to go there. 
Um, so while uh, uh, so it's much easier to experiment and play with these things in the design time uh, than to realize later in production down the line that, uh, oh, maybe we could have chosen a different partition key, which does happen. Uh, if it does happen, you're not alone, uh, but it's uh, just always good recommendation to try to get this up front. All right, uh, so I'm going to uh, go into a quick demo inside the Azure portal to give some more details about the tools uh, and monitoring that you can do to look at your partitions and are you, your are you usage in Cosmos DB. So here I'm in the Azure portal. I'm on my Cosmos DB account. It's called Cosmos Autoscale Demo. And one very useful tool we have here is this Insights tab. Uh, this Insights or Blade. Uh, this comes with a lot of out of the box metrics that you can use to monitor your are you's and also get a sense of your partitions usage. Um, so that the the chart that I probably use the most, and I think our customers use the most, um, is this one here called normalized RU consumption. Let me zoom in so we can see it a bit more. Uh, and let me uh, filter this to a particular database and collection as well. The normalized RU consumption um, is a percentage between zero and 100%. And it's basically, you can think of it as a measure of, of all the RUs that you've provisioned and set, what percentage of them have you actually used? So using 0% means you've used nothing, so it's an idle workload. And using 100% means you've used all the RUs that are there. So in this chart, we can get a measurement of how much we're utilizing our total uh, are used here. So it looks like in this workload, I set it up to have this kind of uh, sinusoidal-like pattern. We're using between 9% and 37%. Um, and if you want to get a sense of the number of physical partitions that you have in your system, you can use this feature, apply splitting by partition key range ID. This is basically a physical partition. And you can see here that I have one, two, three, four, five physical partitions for this workload, which by the way, I provision that 50,000 are used uh, just to show uh, the scale. So I have five physical partitions. And you can see that at each point in time, um, each partition had roughly the same amount of usage. Uh, and the reason for this is I actually chose ID as my uh, partition key. Uh, so I had a synthetic workload, each ID is a GUID. So it has almost pretty much even perfect distribution. Um, so I can see here, I can look at this and conclude that I do not have a hot partition because roughly the pattern is the same for uh, all of the partitions. Uh, now, if I had chosen something that resulted in a hot partition uh, or a hot spot, then what I would see here is I might have one physical partition or a few that spiked up to the max while the other ones were much, much lower. Um, so if you, uh, so this is a good chart to first diagnose uh, one, first, are you utilizing all of your throughput um, if you are always close to the max here, you might want to, and you don't have a hot partition, then you can probably raise your throughput if you need to. If you are extremely low, let's say my utilization was 5% the whole time, right? Probably a sign I can lower my provision throughput and save a lot of uh, cost and money that way. Um, so in addition to helping you fine tune your cost, um, it can also help you assess if you debug if you have a hot partition or not. Um, so once you kind of get a sense of yes, no, might I have a hot partition, you can then go to the next level of monitoring to see what is causing that. Uh, what logical partition key um, is the one that is uh, is the one that is consuming all my throughput? Um, so to that end, uh, you can enable Cosmos DB diagnostics logs. This is an opt-in feature uh, where once you opt in, Cosmos DB will send the data. Um, collect the data, send the data to typically log analytics, but you can also do blob storage or event hubs. And we provide this, uh, this interface here where you can run queries over your data uh, to see what's happening on a per second basis. So this is the most granular form of monitoring you can get in Cosmos DB. Um, this, uh, all the stuff here in Insights is free out of the box, comes at either a five minute or one minute granularity, depending on the metric. Uh, but this is the one that you'd wanna use if you really need to debug or troubleshoot something that requires a per second level granularity. 
Uh, so typically we advise uh, customers to turn this on for maybe like a day or a few days or even a few hours where they want to collect some data uh, and then figure out, troubleshoot their issue and then turn it off just to help optimize uh, their cost if you don't need that such granularity all the time. Uh, now, in terms of the useful data here, uh, so I've already enabled this, uh, the feature on this account. Um, so all you have to do for that is you'll go to uh, here, I can go to logs. Uh, so in diagnostic settings, by the way, I'll just show this. Um, this is where you'll uh, go here and you'll say, um, I already have one, but you'll say I want all of these tables and I want them to go to this log analytics workspace. Um, and once you enable this, it takes me around five, 10 minutes um, for the data to start flowing. Uh, and then from there, I can go to logs and get this open in the context of my Cosmos DB account. Uh, so the most useful tables here are one, there's something, there's one called partition key RU consumption. Uh, and it's basically for every operation that you do, it logs uh, the timestamp at the per second level, uh, as long along with the RU charge and type um, of workload. Uh, so for example, uh, in this workload, I can see for this one, uh, one operation, um, I, this is my partition key, which I mentioned earlier was a random WID or ID. I can see the physical partition ID that it belonged to, the type of operation, so it would be, it could be a create, read, update, delete, et cetera. Uh, the region I went to, which might be useful if I have multiple regions and I want to see which one's the hottest, as well as the RU charge for the request. Um, so with this uh, information, you can write a query. Um, so this is uh, the same syntax as Azure Data Explorer, if you're familiar with that, I think also known as Custo. Um, so it's a reasonably straightforward language to pick up, but once you get it, there's a lot of powerful things you can do. So you can do things like find out, uh, here's this, uh, at a per second level, uh, how many RUs am I consuming second by second, which is this bin by one second. Um, I can do things like try to get a sense, excuse me, of uh, which partition keys, uh, logical partition keys consume the most throughput. So if I did another group by here, by uh, partition key. Uh, and let's just make this um, uh, one minute since that might be a bit granular. Let's get the results. Uh, now, in this case, um, I have a workload that's completely perfectly distributed all rights with partition key random grid. Uh, so every uh, request is kind of equally, uh, equally. Uh, are all the same. Uh, so there's no hot partition here. Uh, but if I did have one partition that was disproportionately consuming our use, I might I would definitely see that reflected in um, uh, in this data here. So uh, this table is a really great one for measuring um, for measuring uh, you know how assessing after the fact if you've chosen a good partition key or you just want to get a sense of how many our user operations are actually consuming. Another useful table here is called uh, partition key statistics, CDB partition key statistics. Um, and this one is about uh, the size of logical partitions. Um, so for this one, this is more of a debugging tool uh, where we'll tell you uh, for the top three largest logical partition keys that all consume at least 1% of your uh, total storage space, uh, how much storage is estimated to be in that key. So if you are worried that your one of your logical partitions might be approaching 20 GB, this would be the table to check. Uh, in my case, because uh, all my logical partitions are GUIDs, I will not have any keys show up here, which is expected. So if you don't see any results here, don't worry. It just means that none of your keys are uh, disproportionately larger than others. All of them are roughly the same, uh, are all roughly the same size, so you're good there. Um, uh, and you're not uh, approaching 20 GB. Um, but if you do have that uh, kind of workload or you might be worried if one of your tenants or one of your uh, logical partition key values is approaching that limit, then this is a good table to check as well. All right. Uh, just taking a quick look, are there any questions on monitoring or tooling here? Um, no, nothing specific. I think we can go on. All right. 
so the last topic I want to uh, cover today um, is a feature we have uh, that's currently in preview called hierarchical partition keys or subpartitioning, which is especially optimized to help for multi-tenant scenarios where you might have tenants that are much larger than the other uh, and you want to make sure they can grow beyond 20 GB of data. So same example scenario as before. This is a quick recap. Uh, when we first discussed this, we put tenant ID as the possible partition key here. Uh, but as we'll soon see, uh, and thanks to anyone who may have pointed this out in the in the chat, it's not always the optimal partition key because you might run into 20 GB for a particular tenant. Uh, so how do you get or how do you partition uh, to handle this fact? Uh, so what you'll do um, is if you see with ten ID, um, ten ID actually does very well on every other aspect of the data access pattern, including querying by tenant, since we can always go to the partition where the query is on, um, querying for a user and a tenant, also efficient, uh, but fails the 20 GB for logical partition, um, logical partition test so it doesn't scale. Uh, so often, uh, prior to this feature, uh, we typically gave customers a workaround, which was to implement their own synthetic partition key option, uh, which means that uh, typically something like tenant ID concatenated with something with higher cardinality. So, for example, you might concatenate and create a synthetic property called tenant ID underscore user ID um, in your own document. So you create a new property with this value. Um, and the main benefit here is you now get out of the 20 GB limit. Your new logical partition is the entirety of the tenant ID and user ID together. So you are very unlikely to hit 20 GB data there. Uh, but now, unfortunately, querying by tenant is always cross partition be, uh, because it has to go to every single partition to find the user for that tenant. Um, uh, and your application and query complexity has increased a lot as you now have to generate these new synthetic documents, uh, pro sorry, properties uh, in your documents. Uh, so this is not an ideal solution either. So you can kind of see we need a solution that gives a green check on all these important data access patterns. Um, it's for this reason we developed the hierarchical partition keys feature. Um, this is, think of it as like a native synthetic key uh, implementation that Cosmos DB supports in which you tell us uh, the partition keys you want, multiple partition keys, up to three levels. And with up to three levels of keys, uh, you'll tell us them in the order of the hierarchy, typically from uh, like the biggest umbrella to the more granular one. So in this case, you could first partition by tenant ID and then sub partition by user ID. Uh, and what happens behind the scenes is that uh, uh, Cosmos DB can allow you to store any arbitrary amount of data for a single tenant ID, as long as the entire combination of tenant ID and user ID does not exceed 20 GB. So this now implies that you can have a uh, single tenant that goes beyond 20 GB, beyond 50 GB, beyond 100 GB, a terabyte, etc. Uh, and as long as you keep writing the data, Cosmos DB will keep adding uh, more physical partitions and splitting your data based on the next level granularity to help you scale. Um, so with this hierarchical partition keys feature, you can now efficiently query by your tenant. Um, in fact, you can, uh, you can query efficiently by any prefix of your partition key path, in this case, which is tenant. Um, and the reason, and it's efficient because at uh, worst, it'll be targeted to a subset of partitions that your data is on. For example, if you had 100 GB of data for your Contoso tenant, that might be across two or three physical partitions. So at worst, you'd visit the two or three physical partitions your data is in, instead of the tens or thousands that you might have. Querying for a user given a tenant is also efficient, since again, you can provide the full logical partition key value. And now you can have more than 20 GB of data for a single tenant, assuming this whole combination doesn't exceed 20 GB for a single value. So you can have 20 GB for a Contoso Alice, 20 GB for Contoso Bob, and so on. If for some reason you find that two levels of uh, granularity are not high enough, uh, we support up to three levels. 
So you could always do something like tenant ID, user ID, and maybe event ID or transaction ID or some other thing with much higher cardinality there. And as long as you can uh, query by the prefix of the full path, then your data, then your queries will still be uh, will still be efficient. Uh, so as a recap the feature, three levels of keys. Uh, your new logical partition is basically the combination of all of these. Um, as a user, you don't have to generate any synthetic uh, keys in your documents. As long as the properties exist, you tell us the properties uh, and we make sure we hash them appropriately in the back end uh, to support this uh, partitioning scheme. And we've covered uh, these benefits already. Uh, so in general, if you have any workload, especially uh, for kind of multi-tenant scenarios where um, you're partitioning by, you would otherwise partition by tenant or synthetic key, um, this is a great option uh, for you. Um, other examples of scenarios are if you have uh, like a, um, if you have like a very um, like high throughput IoT workload where you're storing by, um, where you uh, would run into 20 GB for a single device ID or car vehicle ID, uh, you can subpartition by something with higher granularity to avoid 20 GB limits. Um, another example is in retail. Uh, we had a customer um, who once built an app to store some transactions in their physical store, um, some of which had a lot more data than others. And I think in their pilot, there were only um, like on the order of tens of stores. Um, so. Uh, because of that, uh, the stores that were very large quickly ran to 20 GB. Um, so you could have done something like store ID and then uh, transaction ID um, if individual store was going to be um, above 20 GB. Uh, so it's not just multi-tenant scenarios. Basically, any most scenarios where you think you need a uh, synthetic key can probably be solved with subpartitioning. Um, so this feature is currently in a private preview. Uh, we're supported for uh, the latest versions of the .NET v3 and Java v4 preview SDKs for SQL APIs. Um, and it is a feature for our new containers. Um, so you have to specify the keys up front. Um, but if you'd like to try out this feature, I'll paste the sign up link in the chat. Um, send us your Cosmos DB account name, and then um, we also have some public uh, documentation or GitHub repo uh, where we track issues and feedback there. Um, so we're really targeting um, this uh, feature for especially for um, workloads. Um, uh, I think this cohort is probably the best uh, like audience for this feature, um, multi-tenant scenarios, etc. Uh, so feel free to try it out, send us your feedback, and let us know how we can um, improve it for you. Uh, so with all that, that's all the content that I had for today. 